Hello there, everybody. I uh, do hope that uh, some of you are returning from our last try at, at episode one. So I apologize for last time. I couldn't get back on to tell you what was happening. Out of absolutely nowhere, we had a power outage. So there was just nothing I could do. Internet, everything was down. So I apologize for that last one. But don't worry, you haven't missed anything. We are going to pick up and really just cover that same topic. So hello from New York. Uh, I'm interested in knowing where you folks are. And let me explain what we're going to do today. Uh, I've actually got a little outline here. I've already put it in a Jupyter Notebook. And it's not just today. This is going to be over a couple of episodes. I don't know exactly how many. Probably two, maybe three. Could be more. Just depends on what we want to add to this. One of the things that I like to do sometimes is to render my network. Now, we've, we've given you examples of how you can, for instance, take a convolutional network and reprocess the data so you can see how your network is functioning. And that's all great stuff. And that's really useful when you're trying to show someone that it's identifying things and it's following activity, for instance, if you're processing video. But for someone like me or someone who works with neural networks a lot, we're usually okay just looking at maybe the structure of the network or, or the numbers that are involved and the outputs that it's creating. But what if I wanted to create some kind of a report? Or, or what if, what if you're someone who has a desire to publish, perhaps? I personally don't. I, I just, you know, I'm I guess I'm at a point in my career where I'm looking at maybe another 10 years and then I'm out. So I don't really feel the need to publish a lot. But if I were to publish, It'd be nice to have kind of a rendering of how the network looks. Not that a mathematician needs that, not that a machine learning professional needs that, but if you're trying to present that maybe to an executive or something or to your team, the numbers may not mean as much to them. So that's kind of what my goal is. So hey there, Diana, nice to have you from Chicago and aloha from San Francisco. I think that's the wrong word from San Francisco. I think it's Las Vegas that is what, the fifth island or something like that, but nice to have you, Frederick. Um, so we're, we're going to spend a little bit of time over the next few episodes trying to build a library for ourselves that we could pass a TensorFlow model into, and it will render it in some way. It'll create some visual for us. So maybe the traditional, you know, circles down the left, and then it's fully connected, and, and then eventually, eventually doing something for convolutional layers and things like that, just so we can create a nice graphic that shows how things are working. So for today, as it says here, uh, we're, we've got a couple of tasks I know I need to do. I'm going to need to be able to parse the model so that I can identify how many layers there are, what kinds of layers there are, maybe what the activations are. Maybe there'll be some cool thing we'll do to indicate what the activations are at some point. And, and maybe, not, certainly not right away, but maybe looking forward to the future, it might be useful to be able to decompose our model and take an input, pass it into the model, and then show how the model is being activated. So that's what I mean there when I say by possibly the weights. I, I don't know if we'll do that or not. We'll just see how things go. But I could see that being maybe an interesting animation, perhaps. So maybe we'd even create some, some output from this that would feed into Manon, which is a really great library for doing visualizations. So hey there, Kevin. Nice to see you from Philly. And we've got New Jersey represented a little closer to the East Coast. Nice to have you, Jim. Uh, anyway, so let me get started. And uh, I, I don't know if you know this or not about me. When I teach classes, for instance, so I, I teach, I've, I've been teaching for SANS for, for like 20 years now, more than 20 years. And I teach some of the highly technical classes, like the 503, the deep packet inspection threat hunting class. I uh, teach the 595 class. That's the this stuff here, the machine learning and data science class. And when I do things in the class, demonstrations, write code, I don't do them from a, from a script or anything. I, I kind of just write them. So be patient with me. And, you know, you know my... My sideline here, my subtitle for this whole live stream is Dave's Python Fail. So you see me doing something crazy, let me know. Also, as I'm writing code, if you know a better way to write what I'm writing, please do tell me. I will sometimes write code that is clear, but maybe not efficient. And then I'll go back and kind of touch that up. So, you know, help me out there. So, hey there, Andrew, we've got someone from Dallas, Mexico City. Hey there, Obed and 
Emile from France, welcome. Let me get started with just a couple of imports. I know, for instance, that uh, we're going to be using TensorFlow because, hey, I'm a TensorFlow fan. So let's import that as TF. I also know that I'm going to need to build a model. Now, now remember, we're not going to train a model in this episode. Our goal is to, is to create a, a visualization of it, but I need to have a model to work with. So just to make my life easy, let me import a couple of things out of TensorFlow to do that. Let's go from Tensor, TensorFlow. Dot, what is that? Tens, TensorFlow, TensorFlow, that looks better. Uh, dot Keras, Keras. Let's import uh, layers and sequential. So I'm going to start with what I what I suspect will be an easy task. I mean, I, I kind of have in my mind what I'd like to do for a convolutional layer, but that's definitely going to be a little more challenging. And I'm not even sure that we'll be able to accomplish it using my first approach to the visualization. So I'm going to start with something simpler. I'm going to start with a fully connected dense network and, and build something that can generalize to that. Once we've got that working, we'll turn that into a library. So we'll, we'll talk through how you do that, how you make a Python library and Python classes and stuff. And then we'll talk about, let's add in other kinds of layers. And that might even lead us to change how we're rendering these things out. Because for instance, the way that I'm gonna begin by to render these out is to use graph bits. Now, I don't know if you are familiar with graph bits or not. Let me just get that running. I've already actually uh, installed that. So if, if you happen to you know, wanna go recreate this somewhere, graph is, is just a pip install, very easy to get it in there. Um, and I'm not going to publish the code today because it's I don't really expect it'll do much, but I will absolutely publish this code. So in the next couple of weeks, I already have a GitHub uh, repository for things from this live stream. I'll start pushing the code out there as we do it and refine it. So if you want to use it, you can just grab the library and extend it. Or if you want to recreate it on your own, you can just follow along here. Anyway, GraphBiz, if, if you're not familiar with GraphBiz, one of the nice things about it, it is, it is a domain-specific language that lets you describe in text what you would like some kind of a rendered graph to look like. For instance, I could, uh, I could write some text, whoops, I could write some text potentially that says I have a node A and I have a node B and I'd like them connected to each other. And, and just by putting A dash B, that has happened. When it renders them, I'll have two little nodes and we'll have a line between them. Now that might feel a little like cheating because I'm not making the graphics, but you know, I'm all about cheating. So we're gonna start there. While that should be good for rendering out this neural network and has some real benefits because it allows me to create SVG output, which makes it easily scalable to anything. The downside is that my view of what the convolutional layer would look like is more of a like a flattened cube. I, well, cube is the wrong word, but a flattened layer and showing how they're stacked together. And, and I'm just not sure I can make GraphViz do that. So at some point in the future, we may need to rip GraphViz out and re-engineer doing this in Matplotlib or something else. Uh, let me just get started creating a layer here. So it looks like you know we're writing some code. The reason I'm not starting with, with Matplotlib is that if I started there, I need to start by thinking about how are we going to place the nodes and how do we decide how far apart they are. And I, don't, I just don't need that difficulty yet. Let's first work on parsing the model and getting something printed out. Uh, let's see here. So, uh, oh, yes, thank you very much, Stephen. Oh, I thought you were talking to me. So hello there, Mo Mubahir. I hope that's how you say that. Nice to see you. I didn't see your uh, post come up here, so sorry about that. Thanks for handling that, Stephen. All right, so let's create a sequential model, just a feed-forward network. Let's add some layers to this. Maybe we'll do a uh, layers.dense with four nodes and an input shape of eight. And this is, again, not any particular network. This is just, I need to have some network to work with. So let's just get that in there. Model.add layers not dense let's give it maybe eight neurons with an activation of Borelu. i don't know I, i'm kind of curious so for you folks who uh hey there Stephen, nice to have you so i don't know about you folks 
But if you are someone who works with TensorFlow and you build models, I am, hmm, that's weird. I should you copy that stuff? I wonder if you find yourself using ReLU as opposed to leaky ReLU, not because you prefer it, because for instance, I actually prefer leaky ReLU over ReLU, but I find myself using ReLU just because I don't have to go and do an import for it. It's just there. And then if I have a specific task where I need it, I'll go ahead and use it. So I, are any of you like that? Do do you folks know what, what leaky ReLU is? If you don't, just post something in there. I mean, if you know, I'm not going to tell you, but, but if you don't know, just let me know and I'll be happy to explain it to you. Let's just compile this thing here. Optimizer equals Adam. And let's give it a loss. I'm going to go with cross entropy just because, you know, I've got five neurons in the in the output. So it makes sense that it would be a cross entropy network. And we'll do the standard metrics equals accuracy just so that I have something pretty standard. Hey there, Bob. Nice to have you. All righty. So that should give me a model. Let's just make sure everything is good there. Okay. There's something not happening. Input shape not defined. What did I do here? Oh, okay. It's it's not a function call. It is a keyword argument. There we go. That's much happier. And the other stuff, I did have some warnings there that are gone now. That was just letting me know what it was finding for the GPU and that kind of stuff there. Hey, Emmanuel, nice to have you. Is that, uh, I can't quite make out the flag. I, I hate to guess. I really hate to guess. So I'm not going to, but just could you give me the name of the country? I'm just reluctant to guess because if I guess wrong, see, people get a little bit upset about that stuff. Um, all right. Anyway, so I've got a model now. Let's examine the model. So if we just grab it right there, it is a sequential model. But there's actually some handy, handy functions that are built into the model. And one of them is get config. So the get config, there it is. And what it returns to me here, you can see is a dictionary of all of the different stuff. And in particular, notice here, name sequential one, layers, class name, input layer. The input shape is eight. And then the next thing I have is dense with eight neurons and so on. So it gives me this very handy dictionary output that allows me to, to see what's happening. And I think I read a little too quickly there. So let me let me just come back to this. Actually, here's what I'm going to do. If I ask for name out of that, it's going to give me the name of the model. So that's the name of the model. Hey there, Priya. Nice to have you. And Yasser from Bahrain. I'm not sure. I think you might be the first person from Bahrain. Nice to have you. And hello from Madrid as well. Good to see you, Alexandre. Um, so there's the name of it. But Right after that, I think the next piece was layers. Was that right? Yeah, layers. And layers, looking at it, is a list of stuff. So let's just grab that list. Uh, let's put it over here. I'll call it layers. There we go. That's good enough. And let's look at the first one. So there is the first layer. So the first layer, and, and this is actually kind of convenient. One of the things that I often tell people to bear in mind is that when you're creating these neural networks, it, it actually creates an input layer for you when you're using this approach to creating the model. Either Angela and Sruthi and Muhammad. Wow, we've got a lot of people here today. Good to have you. Um, because when you look at it here, when you look at the creation of the model up here, it appears that the very first layer is a four neuron layer, but it really isn't. It turns out that under the hood, when you use this approach, it's actually cre creating an input layer here, input layer here with a size of eight. It just does it for you. It's automatic. It's kind of hidden from you. If you were using the functional approach, which, which I frequently use, if you were using the functional approach, you must specify the input layer yourself or, or verify that your inputs will be the right shape but here it kind of does it for you. So that's kind of handy. So that means that this first dense layer is actually a hidden layer. Now, what do, what do I mean by that? You can see down here, units four. So that's, that's this one here. What do I mean by hidden layer? 
Well, when we're looking at a neural network or, or you're reading literature about it, you're hearing about the how many hidden layers does it have? And by the way, it's the hidden layers that's giving you how deep it is. Uh, thank you very much, Angela, so from Italy. And Emmanuel, that's what I thought you were from too, but I, I don't recognize the little icon in the middle there. So are you from Italy as well? Or is it just a little different version of the flag? So you didn't want to take a guess on that. What's in the middle of your flag there? And hello to Malaysia. Uh, in any event, so when you talk about whether these are hidden layers or not, it's whether or not they're exposed to the outside wall, world. The input layer isn't hidden. I mean, that's where you put the stuff in. And the output layer, that's not hidden. It's where the outputs come out. It's it's the stuff in between. And that that is where the ability to learn comes from, the ability to really generate some very complex nonlinear relations that allows us to do this mapping. So those hidden layers, this counts as one, even though it's the first layer specified. And it's because this input layer is kind of a hidden thing that appears. In any event, I, in looking at this, looking at layer zero, I can see that it tells me what kind it is. So this is the name of it, right? That's the class name. And this is how it has been named. So I feel like for my own uh, for my own sanity here, I want to take some notes for myself. So I'm just going to create some comments here. So the name of the or the class class of the layer is in class name, and the name of the layer, if it has been named, I'm assuming if it has been named. You know, maybe we'll need to look at another one here. Let me just take a look at number two. Ah, uh, yeah. See, this is now called dense two. Exactly. That's what I was looking for. So the name of the layer is, excuse me, is in name. And I also know I need units. So number of neurons is in uh, units. And eventually, uh, I don't think we're going to do anything with it today, but eventually is in activation. It does feel like it would be cool to do something. So I don't know if that would be that We'll put like, you know, a sigma if it's a sigmoid or I don't know, or maybe a, a little graphic of how the activation performs. Maybe we'll do that eventually. I don't know. We'll just see how we feel about it. I think, though, that I've got enough of the stuff in order to begin creating something out of this. Now, let me see here. So, so I should be able to, if, if I understand this right, I should be able to take a layer, so let's take layer sub zero, and I should be able to access its name directly. Well, okay, sorry about that. Uh, oh, that's interesting. So it does that not have uh, a or units? Does that not have, hmm, okay, hold on. Hold on, let's look at layer sub zero. Uh, okay, so it doesn't have a name. That one doesn't have a name. And it doesn't have an, oh, okay. So interestingly, this one is different. This one has a config. Now, did I did I just misread this on the others? Oh no, the other ones have a config as well. So it's not just there. Uh, so it's inside of config. That that whoops. Sorry about that. That really does matter. So let's say layer one dot config. Or is it okay? I'm having a bad Python day. Oh, I see. Okay. So let's do it this way. So let's access it using its name. There we go. So now I've got my, my thing there. Let's have a look at zero. So zero is a little bit different. Layer zero is going to have a batch input shape followed by the sides. A batch input shape followed by the sides. So let's grab that. So we're just going to be a little brute force today, and we're going to worry about making this better later on. Hey there, Pittsburgh. Nice to have you there. I've got uh, some good friends out in Pittsburgh. Let's grab that. So let's say that the, the what is this going to be? This will be the inputs. Inputs will be our layer zero config, and we want to look at batch input shape, input shape, and that's going to get me here. Let me just put inputs there. That's going to get me inputs, but I don't want that whole thing. What I want is 
is actually, so I was going to say negative one. I was going to say that. Uh, ooh, why is that? Inputs equals colon. Oh, up to negative one. Sorry about that. I was going to say that, but that's not quite what I want. The reason is that this might have multiple dimensions to it. But I think I'm going to go simple for today and say the thing I want is going to be there. That's how many things there are. So those are the number of inputs I've got there in the very first layer. The next thing I need then, I need to be able to create the next piece. I need to be able to grab the next layer. So, so what if, hmm, what if I were to say, and I want to start creating the graph this piece too. So I think I'm going to create that here. I'll say a dot equals graph. So in graph is, you call these uh, these directed graphs. They're usually directed directed graphs or digraphs. This one's just going to be a graph. The the huge difference. It's not a big one. In a digraph, it's going to create an arrow with an arrow head on it. In a graph, it's just going to be a line. And the files that you save are dot files. So it's just kind of traditional that we'll assign the graph that we're building into a thing named dot. All right. So let me create a dot. I'm going to say that this is going to be our neural network. And we'll make this programmatic at some point in the future. And let's see here. Well, let's just see if we can do enough with that so far. And this is going to be our first layer. I need to add these in. I need to add these nodes in. So let me do this. Let me use a list comprehension to do it. I'm going to say, I want you to do a dot, no, dot, dot node. Maybe I shouldn't have used dot. Dot, dot node. And the node I want to add, so I need to give it some name here. I'm going to give it a name of uh, layer zero dash and then n. And n is going to come out of my list comprehension. And let's see here. What else do I need to pass this? Well, let's leave it at that for now. And for, for n in range, or where am I looking here? So inputs, yeah, inputs, that should be right. There we go. And that should mean that I could do something like dot dot format uh, equals, equals SVG. So I'm just telling you what I wanted to create and then I'll ask it to visualize it. And, and there we go. So it's created those, ovals. Well, I'm not thrilled with the ovals. So there are some adjustments I can make to that. One of the adjustments I can make is I can change that so that it's going to define the shape of that. Now, the shape I'd like, I feel like I'd like uh, circles here. So let's try for circles. Let's do uh, shape equals circle. Much better. Okay, I'm happy. All right. That gives me that first layer, but I need the next layer. So let's also grab the next layer. The next layer would be, and maybe we'll be a little bit more generic about this, because eventually this whole thing needs to be in some function that's a set of loops. And we don't, we don't want to be repeating ourselves. I mean, I can't do this every time I create a model. That's going to be a nightmare. That's the whole point of turning it into a library. But for now, Let's say that the number of things I need is going to be coming out of, where's my configuration? Didn't I save that somewhere? Layers, oh, it's in layers. Layers, or where is that? Layers sub one, the first, le well, the second layer, right? The first one after the input, the first hidden layer. And I want to grab the config. And inside of that, According to my notes up here, I want the number of units we have. That should be, and let's just see what that looks like. Four, perfect. So that is the number of units. That's what we have. And let's then, let's add that into our graph. So let's do dot, dot node. And this is going to be layer one dash uh, n. Or comma shape equals circle. We'll stick with circles. I like circles. For an in range, or I, I think. 
And we now have both of those. But in looking at them, I just have this list of circles at this point. So I know you're like, where's the, where's the links? How do you tie those things together? So to tie them together, I need to make them into nodes. Now to make them into nodes, here's what I'm gonna do. Let me take this stuff, move it down here. And let's create a list that I'll name edges. So I have nodes, and now I wanna talk about what their relationship is, how these two things are connected, how they, how they interrelate. So I'm gonna create a, a set of ledges, uh, of edges, and what I want to do is iterate over all of these combinations and create an edge for each one. So I, I would like a list comprehension, but this could end up being a, a nested list comprehension. So it's probably better for me to not do that immediately. And this may end up being abstracted out into a function as I'm kind of thinking through this. So let's just write it as a set of for loops first. And since it's already been, can you believe we have been together for 27 minutes? Is that incredible? And I promise, Stephen, I'm not going to, I'm going to try to keep it to 30 minutes this week. So let me at least get this so they're linked together and we're drawing that, even if it takes a couple extra minutes. So I'm just going to use this nested loops to just build the list of edges we have so far. So let's say for A in range, and the range here will be inputs, right? Inputs, that's the number of input nodes. And for B in range, for I, which is the number of neurons in my first hidden layer, let's say, let's create an edge for each one of those that will connect zero dash A to one dash B. Because in a fully connected network, all of the neurons in the first layer are connected to all of the networks in the second. The neurons are not connected in the layer, they're connected to the next layer. So that should be saying, I wanna connect everything in zero dash whatever. So 0 0, 0 1, 0 2 is going to get connected over to 1 0, 1 1, 1 2. So that should be what that does. I get no errors. That's promising. And oh, and look at that. So we've now got that connected to each other. Although I don't really like kind of the, the layout of that thing. I mean, they're, it's kind of stacked. I'm not sure what you do, but I usually show mine left to right. That's kind of what I do. So let's add a little bit of something to this. There is actually a feature I can use in the, in the graph. When I'm creating the graph, I can specify the direction I want it to go in. And you do that, uh, you've got ranks and columns. So this should be the ranks that I'm trying to change. So I wanna change the rank direction. And let's see, what does it do if we do left to right? How does that act? Or what is it not happy with here? Oh, I'm sorry, that's an assignment. No, it's not an assignment. Why is that not happy? Let's see here. So let me read that more carefully. Let me put that back. Positional argument follows a keyword argument. Oh, it does? Let's see here. Oh, okay, because rank deer isn't its own thing. That's just my memory. I think there's actually like an attributes thing. Maybe it's graph adder. It takes a dictionary of settings. Is that right? Ah, well, it may not be right, but it doesn't generate an error. Let's see what that does. Oh, look at that. So we now are going from left to right. That's not bad. Um, they are a little tight, though. So can we create a little separation there? Let's tinker with that a little bit. So that's another graph attribute. Let's maybe, oh, there's another thing here, too. I'm just noticing it. You know what? Let me let me make it bigger and then I'll point out what it is. So one of the ways we can push these apart, the rank direction lets me rotate it. I can also specify a rank sep, which stands for rank separation. And let me set that to like a 5.0. And okay, maybe I'm remembering that incorrectly here. Let's see what my errors say. Expected stringer bites like object. All right, hold on. 
Let me peek back up here. I think it was rank set, isn't it? Rank set. Let's see. Rank set 2.5. That seems fine. Is that where I made the... All right, let me get that out of there. Let me make sure it still works without that. I didn't make it so... Mm, okay, so it is not rank set. I really think it is. So I feel like... Can I, uh, can I add a tab here? I can. So let's look up graph viz or python or graph and i want a graph pattern i thought it was i thought that's what it was let's see if we can find it here okay it might be a little bit too far down here so let's go for a separation see if we can find that okay no that doesn't look great rank i thought it was rank set so let's search for that no i'm not finding it there but that could also be where i am because read the docs is not always the best place to go let me try it here let's try rank set it's really what i thought it was all right we've got an example here rank set oh yeah rank set so that does feel like it's right why is mine not happy and it is showing it here for a directed graph all right, let's look back at my code. Let's see, did I do something stupid in there? Er, where am I? So rank set equals, whoops. No, I'm, I'm wondering to myself, none of you are helping me, but that's okay. Did I put that in as a number? What could it be? Could it be that it wants that as a string, which is weird. Oh man, that is what it is. It wants it as a string. So we've pulled them all apart. Now, in the process of doing that, I've actually concealed the other problem. So, all right, one last thing, and then I'm going to let you go for today. Let me just set it to two. You can, you can sort of see it. It almost looks like a visual, a, um, a what do you call those things, uh, where you look at it and it looks one way, but it's, it's actually something else. I can't think of what it is, like the Escher diagrams and stuff. Um, so it might look, look like a visual trick, but if you look at these lines that are in the middle, so these lines in here, they're actually not straight. And it's a little bit more apparent, or it was more apparent to me when they were closer together. Yeah, you can definitely see it now. See that? These guys are curving. So let's just fix that before we call it a day today. And I think that the way we do that is by saying whether or not we wanted to use splines. The default here is that it will use splines. And I don't want it using splines or Bezier curves. So when I change that up, ah, they're now nice and straight. There still is that, what do you call it? I can't think of that word. So the when you look at a thing and there's that, you know, look at this diagram of these lines and do you see the gray boxes in between? And there's actually no gray boxes. It's just the, ha, huh, what's the name of that thing? I just can't think of it. Oh, thank you very much, Greg. I'm glad you're enjoying it. All right, so I'm just going to push this apart a little bit so I remember. I'm going to stick them at three. There we go. And that might turn out being too wide. We're probably going to have to make that dynamic. But at this point, we at least have a start. And, and I'll tell you, the very next thing, we've got a proof of concept. Definitely, I can draw a graph this way. So next time, and I'm actually going to write notes for myself down here. So next time, next episode which will be in about two weeks. We'll do it on the same on Friday. What we need to do is we need to put this into a function. So turn that all into a function that can automatically build the entire picture of the entire network. So it may not feel like we've made a lot of progress today, but we actually have because all the code we have here does most of that. Now we just need to, kind of stand back and figure out how to abstract that so I can give it the model and it just does all of the pieces. So we're going to come back and we'll do that in about two weeks. I do hope you found this kind of interesting. Uh, we are going to continue on this theme on Fridays of being generally about machine learning and data science feeding into that, uh, that six-day class we've got now. And by the way, that is coming up. Uh, I'm doing it in what is this month? This is February. So in March, I'll be doing it in uh, in both European time and on Asian Pacific time. So if you're looking to get together with me for that, 
there is a great opportunity there. It's a really wonderful class. We, we talk through the theory and then we write all the code. So it's, it's just a, it's a phenomenal class. Uh, I just can't describe it any differently. Um, it's also available on demand these days. And on demand is great. We've got a lot of recordings in there, a lot of animations. I, I don't even know how many hours it turned out to be. It was a lot of recording time. But as for me, I kind of prefer a live instructor. Now, if you do end up choosing to take the class and you do it on demand, you're welcome to reach out to me directly. So I'm very happy to help you any way I can. Anyway, thank you very much for tuning in. Thank you very much, James, for your feedback. If you have any other thoughts or comments, please do let us know. And please like, follow, or subscribe so you can be alerted the next time we have a screen. Have a wonderful afternoon.